my parents went out to a movie and they said it was too violent and they wouldn't take me to it. It was a Western. And we were living in Haddon Heights, New Jersey. They walked to the local cinema and they went to see John Ford's The Searchers. Yeah. And they came back and they wouldn't stop talking about it. So I went the next day, it was on a Saturday. I think they went Friday night. I went on Saturday. I went into the petty change base. We had like quarters. And I took out two quarters and I walked all those, I walked a mile and a half like you. And I saw the searchers unaccompanied all by myself. And it was, it was, it was. One of I probably didn't understand the movie at seven as well as I or nine or eight. I, I probably when I saw the movie multiple times after that, I understood it better. But I know how it feels to be left behind, and then realizing that that's a film that I could have used my mom and dad helping to explain it to me as I was watching. Your mom and dad could have helped you explain that at the beginning. A lot of young kids are afraid of ET when ET first comes out of the ship. A lot of kids are scared of ET's appearance. I obviously as a child was very traumatized by the breakup of my family and I'd be attracted to subjects like an empire of the sun of a boy, a war separates a boy from his parents who spent the entire time in a Japanese internment camp in China. Um, I'm sure I, had my parents not gotten a divorce, I would not have chosen Empire of the Sun as a film to direct. So I think all of that is part of the gestalt that gets and that motivates all of us to make those key decisions about commitment. What do we commit to? And, and, and because when I commit to a movie, I'm committed to something in a sense for the rest of my life. Well, I, I, was, I was looking for a cameraman, a director of photography for Schindler's List, and I hadn't found one. And I happened to be watching a television show, a movie made for television by Diane Keaton, the first movie Diane Keaton ever directed, uh, was a film uh, called Wildflower. And I knew it was on, and I watched it, and I was very impressed with the work of Diane Keaton. I was equally impressed by whoever the cinematographer was. And, I, I, and what impressed me about the cinematography was the audacious use of warm and cool colors in the same shot. He'd have a warm foreground and a very cold background. He'd have an actors in the foreground with very cool light, and yet the sun would be warm coming through the windows. And I thought that, that the kind of uh, just the contrast of, of, of the, his palette, the choice of his palette, amazed me. I didn't meet him yet. I hired him to do a pilot. I was I was going to produce for ABC, and he did about he did the pilot, and the pilot was equally good. Meaning I was I, I wanted to make sure it wasn't a fluke, <laughs> and then I met him. And, and the thing that I didn't realize was that. His name was Janusz Kaminski, so obviously he was Polish, but was he Polish-American? No, he was born in, in Poland. And uh, right there in the office I said, do you want to shoot a film in black and white? Have you ever shot in black and white? He said, uh, in, in Poland, we could only afford black and white film school. <laughs> so I've only shot in black and white. So that was a marriage made in movie heaven. And we've worked together ever since 1993. Your question about Duel, right? Initially, um, uh, I had never read anything like that before. So I, I, the only experience I ever had with Duel was being afraid of the big trucks in my rearview mirror. So I, I can certainly relate to that. Um, uh, but I didn't really uh, immediately think of another filmmaker that had made a similar film. I certainly, um, I'm a big fan of the French Wages of Fear, and 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 that Billy really Friedkin subsequent remake, Sorcerer. But this was long before the Sorcerer when I, when, when I was. Duel was a short story of Playboy magazine written by Richard Matheson that my secretary gave me and said, you should make this into a movie. She gave it to me and I read it and I thought it was extraordinary and then discovered that they were actually going to shoot it for ABC television as a movie of the week. And I lobbied really hard to get that job because I somehow felt I had an affinity to the subject matter. I don't know why. Uh, and I don't even know who influenced me to have affinity with that kind of subject matter. But um, it was best, one of the best choices I ever made because it opened up the whole world for me. I began getting offers to direct movies for the first time. So Duel uh, allowed a lot of producers to trust me and offer me their films. So I, I, and Truffaut, nobody liked him. Um, he, he was a child at heart. And yet he was, like the title of his film, he was a wild child. 
And I, wor I worked with him four months in Mobile, Alabama, and Warcraft, Wyoming, on Close Encounters for the third time. And he, he, some of my reason for making E.T. came from Truffaut. Because Truffaut had just made this film called Small Change. And he had the best time working with children. And he said to me, he said, you have the heart of a child. This is what he said to me in broken English. He said, you have the heart of a child. You need to make a movie with keys. He said, keys. <laughs> and I never forgot that. And when I came up with the story for E.T., I always remember that Truffaut was the one that said, you got to make a picture with kids. It played a great deal. My mom, as you know from the movie, she, uh, the way Michelle Williams very accurately portrayed my mom, she was a very forthright, um, uh, uh, she celebrated life every day of her life. And, and my mom really believed in, in being reactive. And by being reactive, she made a lot of decisions that were reactive decision, decisions. But it's who she was. If she wanted to do something, she did it. If she wanted to jump in the army jeep and pile us all in to go look at the stars in the middle of the desert in Arizona, that would be her idea, and we would jump into the jeep and we'd go see the stars. I mean, she, and, and so in a sense, when my mom had this restaurant for all these years before she passed away, she would always say, when are you going to tell our story? We had a, my, my mom used to say, I've given you so much good material. <laughs> when are you going to use that material? And, and, I were, I was, and during the pandemic, that was one of the things that crossed my mind. And I think the pandemic so scared me. The fear of, at, in the early stages of the pandemic, at the beginning of 2020, uh, we, in April, when we all sort of went inside, didn't come out for a long time, I started thinking about mortality and aging, and I started thinking about the fact, in a way, the fear I felt about the pandemic gave me the courage to tell my personal story. I, I was so involved with two films back to back that were very personal for me in different ways. West Side Story, I wanted to make a musical my entire life. That's the greatest musical ever written for the Broadway stage. I didn't want to do anything. I, was, I, I had developed some original musicals, which I didn't care for. And, and then the Fablements happened quite spontaneously while I was still in post-production on West Side Story. Tony Kushner and I began to write the Fablements, and we shot the Fablements before West Side Story even came out. So those two films overlap. Because that was such a time drain, I never had a chance to think about what am I, what am I going to do when these two movies are over? And I sit here in front of all of you saying, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I have no idea. And it's kind of a nice feeling, and it's also a horrible feeling. It's nice that I can actually have control of my life again and do what I make my own choices in my real life. But I need to work, and I love to work, and uh, that's the biggest question I'm going to have for the rest of the year, trying to figure this out. <laughs> my favorite Oscar Burner performance is The Spy Who Commits the Cold, Martin Ridstone, with Claire Bloom and, and with Richard Burton. Um, uh, uh, but Truffaut and I were very close. Uh, I knew him from the time I made Raiders. I met him on, on the Elf Street lot when he was preparing The Shining and I was preparing Raiders of the Lost Ark. And we met in, I think, November 1979. Uh, he invited me to his house for supper that night and we remained close friends until the day he died. So I'm honored to have known him for that time, and, and the only film we ever discussed doing together was AI Artificial Intelligence. But we are uh, mounting a big production uh, with the cooperation of uh, Christian Kubrick and Jan Harlan. We're mounting a large production for HBO on, based on Stanley's original script, Napoleon. So we are working on Napoleon as a, a seven-part uh, limited series. Thank you. No, I mean, I know it's a bit cliche to say this, and it's, it's not very newsworthy, but uh, my films are like my children. I do not have a favorite. <laughs> but at the same time, I can't tell you, the hardest film I ever made was Jaws. <laughs> Der Weisser High. <laughs> that was the hard, there you go, that was the hardest film I ever made, physically. And the most, most emotional movie I ever made uh, for a long time was the Shivers List, but now the most, the most emotional film I was ever involved in was The Fablements, uh, which was very difficult for me because I was telling a story with a lot of, well, a lot of funny parts, but, but with a lot of parts that were 
very traumatizing, and even recreating those scenes was very, very hard to relive it. That, that was, so that became maybe emotionally the most involved I was thus far making a, a, a film. That scene in the Fablements is word for word, to the best of my recollection, what actually happened to me. He said no more or no less than the words he speaks in that film. Because I've been telling the story to friends of mine for so many years, the dialogue is, is actually closer to my memory when that incident actually happened. So I think that might be the most accurate scene in the movie, uh, word for word anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, J John Ford was a force of nature. He really was. And for many, many years, I was really, uh, I was really, um, scared by what he said, and embarrassed by what he said, and shamed by what he said. And 20 years later, I realized what he had actually done was giving me a tremendous gift. He, he didn't just invite me to his office to let me tell him how much I love movies and how much I love his movies, but he actually gave me some advice that, that made sense to me. Not in the moment, I was still in high school, actually. I was a, I was a junior in high school when I met him. I was actually 16 years old. Um, but uh, that advice he gave me about the horizon uh, was, was a gift, and it was a gift. He might have done it in a really gruff way, like a really tough headmaster. The advice I usually give is not so much about how to make shots interesting, but how to recognize interesting stories and, and how to tell stories, because I, I, I think filmmakers need there are so many, there are so many opportunities to learn from so many great uh, cineasts in, in work, working today. I learn actually more from young filmmakers today than I do from some of the older filmmakers that made movies 80, 90, 60 years ago. Uh, because some of the new filmmakers today are doing such audacious work. Um, the Daniels, such amazing genius work on everything everywhere all at once. And, uh, so, and I'm learning from young filmmakers so much. Uh, but one of the things I'm learning is you got to have a good script. I've always said if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. And I really believe that. And so my advice is to, if you want to be a, a movie director, first of all, write. And if you don't feel that's your strong suit, meet somebody whose strong suit is storytelling and writing and form a little bit of partnership. Because, because it's the stories that are going to get an audience to pay attention to you, not the shots. But my name, which I did not choose, uh, which I got from my father, uh, which is an Austrian name, which essentially means play town or play mountain. My first production company when I was 13 years old, I, I was copying Paramount, and I called it Play Mount Productions. <laughs> and I even had a mountain on it, you know, I was ripping out Paramount when I was like 13. But I think in a way, it is sort of the name is, is you know, has given me a, a, a sense of humor about myself um, because it really does mean that the work I do as a filmmaker, if I'm not playing as I'm working, if the play isn't doesn't match the, the, the level of the work, then I'm not going to have any fun. And and even on films that are very very uh, you know difficult in terms of production or emotionally uh, draining because of the subject matter, you know. There's always been a sense of play in my films, which has always allowed me to add humor even to the most miserable moments of, of, of the story. And so maybe that's associated somehow with the name that my father gave me. You know, the honor about a Lifetime Achievement Award is just simply it forces me to do something I don't often do. And it forces me to reflect. And reflecting means I'm not moving forward. For me, when I reflect, it means I'm I'm spending too much time in neutral, just remembering. Uh, but I think what happened, when I lost my dad uh, three years ago, and I lost my mom today, she died six years ago today. My mom, Leah Adler Spielberg Posner. And, um, and I, I think it put me into a reflective mood after mom passed away. And my father was still living, but that's one of the things combined with the extra time I had during COVID to really do an accounting and do look back. So, and, 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 and then I did look back to try to figure out what, what story I could tell about my formative years. And that's in a sense what a Lifetime Achievement Award does. It takes you, it sends you back into the past. Whether you want to go there or not, it makes you very reflective.
and, 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 and to be honored in Berlin, uh, which is one of the most august you know, festivals in history, is a, a tremendous high, high point in my life, this, this honor. Well, the Shoah Foundation has been the greatest social work I've, I've done in terms of consciousness building. And I, I think Schindler's List in, in, you know, kind of imbued me a, a responsibility to do something beyond the film because often films have a very short shelf life in terms of attention, the, the, holding the attention of the world. Not all films can do that for very long. But I really found it quite profound to have, I invited some of the survivors of Oscar Schindler's List to come watch us shoot the film. And several of them were asking me to tell their stories. And, and when a filmmaker hears somebody say, tell my story, I, I'm thinking they want me to make a movie about their particular story. But no, that's not what they wanted at all. They wanted an outlet to be able to talk about what happened to them. And they wanted to be able to create a, a memoir of their own experiences, everyone they lost, every, what, what, the, what they were like growing up in Hungary or Poland or Germany before the war, and then what happened during the Holocaust. And that's what put it in my mind to create a foundation where we would send archivists and, and visual historians all over the world to collect these testimonies. And that became, for me, the most important work that ever came out of the motion picture. And I'm, and I'm very, very proud of that. And, and that is something that I, I'm still very active in. And we are now collecting testimonies um, uh, all over the world, including you know, third and fourth generation Armenian testimonies, uh, uh, collecting testimonies in Sarajevo, collecting testimonies in Cambodia, testimonies in Rwanda. So, so the archives expanded beyond the Holocaust to other genocides. And, and, and Germany was our first, Berlin, was our first European headquarters in 1994 for the Shoah Foundation. Bertelsmann financed uh, our entire headquarters here where we started collecting testimonies all throughout Western Europe. Every scene I direct, uh, there has to be a reason for the scene. If, if there's no reason for the scene, this, this, then you should cut it out and not waste and save some money. Um, and that essentially means that I'm very focused on what is every scene saying to make a whole based on the sum of many, many disparate, often disparate parts. And so, you know, I, I, the, the, the primary characters, the secondary characters, there really aren't secondary characters. And every movie, you know, every character makes a contribution to the telling of the story. And so there's, there's no unimportant character in any story at all. And if there are unimportant characters, they shouldn't even be included in the, in, in the script. Um, and, and so every, and so it's, it's like building a, a, a painting, it's like building a, a picture based on tiles. You know how you tile things, and when you put a thousand tiles together, they form one face. You see those portraitures of people's faces, and if you walk up to the portrait, there, there are tens of thousands of teeny portraits making up one, one large uh, uh, face. And that's what a movie really is for me. It's all, a movie is the sum of all of the details. And I always say, and I've always say this to young film students, don't sweat the big stuff. That, that'll take care of itself. But you gotta sweat the small stuff. And that, I think, is the best answer I can give you right now to avert the question. Thank you all very, very much.